my great pleasure to present my work in a, in a sustainable finance forum and for the, of the University of Zurich. And today I'm going to talk about my paper, Firm Level Climate Change Exposure. This is a co-authored work with my colleagues in Frankfurt School, Zach, Lawrence, and Greg. And we started working the, on this project maybe this February, and this turns out to be a very interesting work, and I'm willing to share the insights we got with you guys. This paper obviously, obviously is about climate change, and the background of this, uh, this climate finance or sustainable finance is that we, we start kind of reach a, start reaching a consensus like climate change uh, is more or less kind of have large or significant impacts on, on the firms. So these impacts can be, for example, uh, due to the physical shocks or physical climate conditions. Like, uh, for example, the insurance companies may have to settle down some payments due to the extreme, uh, extreme weather or some coastal floods. And real estate companies may also kind of suffer some damages from those coastal floods if they are building some resorts or apartment buildings near the, near the ocean or near the seashore. So, uh, but on top of that, we also see many regulatory changes in, in recent years. For example, we have the emission goals by the EU. We have uh, all kinds of um, proposals or regulations on carbon tax and many other things. So all these regulatory impacts or regulatory shocks is, are going to create some impacts on firm level as well. But, but given all these kind of uh, downside impacts, we also have more, or we, in our opinion, we have more upside, uh, upside impacts. For example, to, to combat the global warming or to reduce emissions. So we are starting to have electric cars. We are starting to have, to, 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 to have more renewable energies. And if in our daily life, now we have some, some firms are trying to make this vegan meat, right? This, uh, this absolute meat or beyond meat, try to reduce the emissions from agriculture. So all these kind of new business, new products are kind of related with climate change. And that's due to the climate change impacts our living, impacts our life, and so the economy will change. And this upside impacts should also be considered when we study the climate change, especially the, in terms of the, the finance, because we're interested in firms and firms are going to do business in those new um, area. However, we, we still have a heated debate. For example, this year, International uh, Monetary Fund uh, try, uh, were, were accusing that investors are not paying sufficient attention to the climate change. But on the other hand, we do have many uh, many things like ESG funds, or we have um, all this M MPO, or we have uh, this uh, PRI. Many many organizations try to promote the climate change or sustainable finance to the investors or to the market, and uh, the debate is is being heated. And um, this is the background of our study. However, to contribute to the debate or to to contribute to the to the uh, to the research on sustainable finance. Uh, both regulators and um, investors and even academic researchers are facing a challenge. The challenge is to quantify the firm level exposure to climate change. Because if we, if we, if we want to study it, if we want to trade on the climate change exposures, we need to have a solid measure on that. And this paper, as the title suggested, is trying to suggest a method to identify and quantify this firm level exposure to climate change. However, it's not easy because first of all, we, we are facing a, a high uncertainty when, uh, when, try to, when, when quantifying this uh, climate change. The first thing is about climate change itself because no one would know how the climate will eventually change. We are in the process of climate change. That's a dynamic procedure. And everyone inside it cannot, for example, we are inside this procedure, we, we, we cannot see the full picture of it. We can only know the past, but it's very hard for us to predict future. We, for example, what's the temperature being in, in the next 20 years, although we have this two degree goals. And also on the other hand, it's difficult or it's uncertain whether, how, and when these policymakers will kind of tighten the regulation and try to use what kind of, you know, regulatory tools 
to combat the, the potential climate change. Uh, this regulatory uncertainty will also have a strong impact on the business or on the, on the firms. Given the uncertainties, we have to also acknowledge the heterogeneous, uh, the heterogeneity uh, across the firms in terms of the effects of uh, climate change. Just like I, I, I mentioned before, for some firms, they are, they are they are operating in more climate change intensive industry. For example, these um, firms operating in the energy or in, in utilities. Naturally, because they are doing with energy and renewable energy will be one of the key topics to combat climate change. And those firms obviously will may, may have high exposure. And even within the utility firms, some firms may work in the, for example, you know, wind, uh, wind power. Some works, with, uh, some may work with uh, ocean wave powers. Some, some may, you know, doing nuclear power, and the others will do the traditional electricity generating. So, given their different business model, they even within the same industry, the same sector, they could still have different exposure or different effects of climate change. And given all the uncertainty and heterogeneity. Uh, the, the industry or the academia, academia currently have no common practice or have little common, common practice for how to reliably quantify the firm level climate change exposure. And we do have some, uh, some measures, but, but I think the, the, the key problem for the lack of common practice is due to the, I think, the limited or selected disclosure of samples. For example, in the SP, S&P uh, 500 firms, I think only about half of them are reporting their carbon emissions. And if we are trying to construct such a measure based on their voluntary disclosure or based on their soft disclosure, then we are going to have a data problem. And also if we, the climate change is going to, you know, evolve, involve a lot of future events. And also we are, we are trying to understand how the firm will cope with the climate change instead of, instead of what they did. And by the common, by the data we have now, the readily available data, for example, the carbon emission or the, their, their ESG data is more or less based on the, the past performance. And if that will be hard if we are going to study some future applications, like maybe we want to study the pricing effect, we want to, 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 to value the, the potential you know, cost due to the climate change, or we want to value the potential gain from the climate change, that's going to be a little bit difficult if we only rely on past information. And the last thing is, just take, take the emission as an example, because the emission data is one of the most commonly used data to, to kind of uh, proxy for the climate change exposure. We don't distinguish actually now the good water spite emission. The meaning of good emission is that because we are still trying to achieve a new emission neutral or, or, or zero emission goal, so we, we need to use some emission quota to build some, maybe some PPEs or some, some device or some machines to reduce the future emission. Just like if we are buying an uh, electric car, which kind of helps a lot to reduce emission, but building that car requires some emission. So basically, if we only look at, look at the emission data itself, maybe Tesla will have a very high emission, but their emission is used to kind of achieve a, a, a goal of reducing emission. So if we don't distinguish that, we may kind of mix, you know, some, some we, we will have some mi misleading results if we solely use the emission data. And also just, just to further back up the, the, the point about we lack of the, the lack of quality measures on climate change or on the ESG in general, we have two sources, two pieces of news. On the left hand side, that's a, that's a survey, I think, uh, quoted by the Bloomberg. And their survey is asking the, the hedge fund managers why they are not using ESG strategy or what's the biggest challenges uh, they are facing when adopting an ESG investing strategy. And the lack of quality data ranks on the top. So many of the fund managers say they, they are willing to, you know, know more, know more about ESG or uh, they are willing to consider climate change in their investing strategies, but they don't have data to do that and makes it, makes it very difficult 
for for the investors or for the uh, to 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 actually consider climate change. And on the other hand, uh, in a recent go uh, recent news uh, from the Financial Times, they are saying Europe leads the world with its climate emission climate emission. So the European uh, European Commission is trying to reduce their emissions with a very ambitious goal. And however, if we if we want to reduce emissions, we really need to understand which emissions are good and which which are bad. And for the policymakers, they still need a measure of the like, firm level exposure to the climate change. Then they can make policy interventions to get through get the firms to to maybe reduce emission or to you know uh, finance or give subsidies to the uh, to the green firms and maybe have some uh, interventions on the brown firms. But if we want to do that, we first need to know which firms are green or exposed more to the climate change. So in our paper, in our paper, briefly, we, we introduce a method that try to identify uh, the firm level climate change exposure from earnings conference calls. So here we are trying to avoid using this uh, emission data, or we are trying to overcome the difficulty of, uh, of lack of data, lack of source data by using the textual data, using the conference calls transcripts. And given we are using the conference calls, we are, we are, we are suffering much less from the, from the data limitations, so we can have a broader coverage. So we have uh, the conference calls maybe from the early of the century, from 20, 2002 until the last year, and we keep updating our, our measures. And the coverage will be more than 10,000 firms from 34 countries. And also in this paper, we spend maybe uh, most of our empirical tasks to, to uh, validating our measure. So on top of the, you know, the very fundamental face validity, so we are trying to show that, you know, what is inside the measure and how, you know, how the managers and, and analysts are talking about climate change during the conference calls. On top of that, we also show some cross-sectional and time series variation that aligns with reasonable priors, try to convince you our measure is capturing climate change exposure indeed. And to to handle the or to to capture the fact that the climate change has multifaceted effects, we we then kind of divided our measure into three subtopics: uh, the, the opportunities related to climate change, the physical climate shocks, and also regulatory shocks. And by this, uh, by dividing our overall exposure measure into three topics, we can then have more meaningful kind of decomposition of the measure and further distinguish why the firm is kind of have a high climate change measure, whether it's due to opportunity, for example, maybe Tesla, or it's due to regulatory, you know, potential regulatory intervention. And most importantly, our data is now publicly available at the following uh, website, the Open Science Foundation, and feel free to use it. And we are happy to, to, share, uh, to share our data and also to to receive some feedbacks on how we can improve our data and also improve improve this paper. I think the contribution of, of this our paper is pretty straightforward. We provide a measure to the growing climate change literature with a large coverage and with maybe potential, um, you know, a potential way to handle this multifaceted effects and to isolate different types of climate change exposure and give you a chance to separate the downside and, and upside effects. On the other hand, on the other hand, we do introduce a new methodology to the to the finance literature that uh, that help us to construct our measure. And that methodology is not specific to climate change itself. Maybe other topics, other researchers can also adapt this methodology in, in other studies. For example, if you want to construct another measure from a conference call or other textual data, I think the methodology can definitely help. And the things that matter is the most important thing of the paper. I think I will spend most of my presentation to discuss how the measure was constructed. The, the firm level climate change exposure, uh, you know, the measure is based on the conference calls, it's based on tax. And the logic behind it is pretty simple. The logic is like we want to quantify the proportion of a conference call that you know, that's discussed about particular 
topics uh, on climate change. And we will, we will use that proportion or use that ratio as a measure of the firm's exposure to climate change. So basically, if in your conference call, there are many sentences uh, talking about climate change, then we will, we will expect a high exposure. Or in a conference call where no one has mentioned anything about climate change, then the exposure will be almost zero. But there are three key questions behind this logic. The very first one is why using conference call? And also there are two implementation problems. In, uh, the first one is how to identify these keywords related to climate change. So basically, how do we how do we know which part of the conference call is discussing climate change? Climate change, and then how can we separate climate change into these multiple uh, different effects, sub effects? We start from uh, so basically we 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 will answer these three questions one by one. The, the conference call normally consists two parts. The first part is management presentation. So the manager will briefly introduce their business model, recent operations and performance to the participants. And then the conference call is followed by a Q and A session. So the, so the participants, normally they are financial analysts, will ask questions to the manager and the manager will kind of give, give response. And of course, the analysts uh, uh, can also ask probing questions if they are not satisfied by the response from the management. And by having this kind of Q&A session, I think we think the conference calls are less susceptible to greenwashing by the management. So basically, if the analyst is not satisfied by the potential greenwashing or exaggerations on the positive side of climate change, they can, you know, Give counterpoints by asking pro, uh, pro, uh, probing questions and uh, try to push the managers. And by having this, we will consider the the, the manager from the developed from the conference calls may be more objective comparing to the manager uh, developed from you know the the, the disclosures by the firm where the the, the firm has a um, hundred percent you know the you know of uh, I say the discretion on what they are going to disclose. And on the other hand, because the conference call becomes more and more regular uh, uh, yeah, for firms in the, as a, since 2000, so we can have a much broader coverage than relying on this climate change or ESG disclosure from the firm. And on top of, on top of the exposure measure, so basically on top of the proportion of conversations during a call that, is, that discusses climate change, we also develop two additional measures, the climate change risk and the climate change sentiment. So basically they are the, they are the two, two measures conditional on some, some further requirements based on the, the measure of exposure. So for the risk measure, we require the exposure, the, the, the discussions about climate change, we also discuss some uh, risk or, or symptoms of risk. Um, uh, similar for the for the sentiment, we we require the sentence where the manager or the analyst mention a word about climate change. We also have sentiment words words, and by having those, we can construct the sentiment and risk of climate change of the conference calls uh, transcripts. And you know, if we're happy with using conference call transcripts to to construct our exposure measure, and the most important problem we are going to solve is to identify climate change. So in the previous literature, like Hassan et al. 2019 and Hassan et al. 2020, they are using a pre-specified training library to, 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 kind, of, uh, to kind of create a library, uh, a library consists of many diagrams or words, and that wor those words are, are associated with some topics. So for example, they can, comp they can use political textbook and political news and uh, remove this non-political political text from the political textbook and they can have a library about you know politic uh, po uh, policies or politics or if you are trying to construct this folder for example to COVID-19 and you can just use the self-evident words like COVID or coronavirus right but in our case it is really hard 
to, to apply this pre-specified training library method in identifying climate change. And we really tried hard. I think the underlying problem is if we're trying to find some climate, climate change reports, you know, which is likely to be the, a, a candidate for a, for a pre-specified training library, but these reports usually include too many content related to other areas. For example, there, were, there are going to be some, some really scientific stuff. There are going to be some economics implications and also sociology or potential technology you know, impacts of climate change. And these words is hard to be fully removed it, because it's because they cover too many different areas. We, 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 if we want to fully remove all those words, we need also some materials, for example, we need some materials only about economics, but not about climate change to remove these economic words from this IPCC report or climate change reports. But if, but if we cannot do that, then we apply this pre-specified -train, uh, pre training library, use that, to, uh, use that to identify the proportion of conference calls discussing about climate change, then we will end up with a very noisy measure because a lot of words in the IPCC reports is not about climate change, right? And on the, on the other hand, the climate change, uh, you know, the climate change reports are written by the experts or scientists they tend to talk very differently from the conference call participants and they focus on different, uh, you know, different aspects of climate change. So given these two reasons and, and our, our you know, attempts to use this pre-specified library was not very successful. So we turn to, you know, the literature and find this keyword searching algorithm developed by King et al. And that algorithm helped us to successfully identify keywords about climate change from the transcript call uh, from the transcripts of conference call themselves the keyword searching algorithm is pretty intuitive uh, unlike this pre-specified training library method the input for this training uh, for this algorithm is very small we only need around 50 initial climate change backgrounds which are for sure about climate change for example, they can be climate change, global warming, or renewable energy, and so on. And then we use that, and then we kind of pull some sentences from the conference call transcripts and build a training library. So in the training library, we ask the machine to do a very simple job. We ask the machine to predict if a sentence in the training library, or if a sentence from a, trans, uh, from a conference call is about climate change or not. And we gave this, uh, this we, we make this decision by ourselves because we need to specify the target value in the training library. So the rule is very simple. If a sentence contains any of the initial backgrounds, then the sentence will be, have a value of one. That means the sentence is about climate change. And otherwise it will have a, it will have a, have a value of zero. So it's not about climate change. And the machine will read through all the sentences and read through our, you know, classification, and then machine will learn about, you know, which sentences, uh, which sentence is about climate change. Although our, you know, judgment or is using solely the fifty initial backgrounds, but the thing is, in a sentence talking about maybe mentioning climate change, the pe people will 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 be likely to mention other more detailed words about climate change, but didn't specify in the initial backgrounds. Uh, right, and then the machine it's kind of, the machine will also pick up those words, and then we have a much larger prediction models, and then we apply these machine learning models to all sentences that do not have any initial backgrounds, because the machine actually in the training library, the machine can learn much more than the initial climate change backgrounds, so they can still kind of try to classify those sentences without adding initial backgrounds into two categories, but climate change related or not. And then after we have these predicted positive sentences, and we are trying to re reverse engineer the algorithm, we are trying to find which backgrounds are best at discriminating with positive or negative predictions. And those, you know, and those backgrounds will be the climate change backgrounds. It may sound a little bit complicated, but the intuition is very simple. 
So basically, if we're mentioning some general climate change terms, people are likely to use a detailed climate change backgrounds that are hard to specify ex ante by researchers. For example, we specify electric vehicle as an initial background, and in our you know, in our results in the climate change backgrounds or climate change keywords, we are using the paper, we found Tesla battery or hybrid plug, which are clearly about climate change, but you know, hard to be specified by researchers ex ante. And similarly for renewable energy, we have nuclear power and we even have event Fukushima, which is a, a, a disaster uh, call, or a accident, a accident caused to the nu uh, nuclear power event in Japan, uh, plant in Japan. And also we, we found some projects or location names related to climate change. This can be KB Wind or this Jacqueline Valley or Coughlin Power. They are project names and in conference call it's kind of common for analysts to ask questions about this, um, uh, this uh, with projects or locations, uh, the firms are building renewable energy facilities. Uh, but this kind of words is very difficult to be specified by the researchers ex ante. And next, we are trying to identify some subtopics about climate change. And the method will be very simple. So instead of fading the, the, the searching algorithm with the, the general climate uh, change, uh, climate change backgrounds, we're going to feed the algorithm some unique sets of climate change. Uh, we are going to feed the algorithm with some initial backgrounds talking about solely, for example, solely about opportunities or solely about regulations or solely about physical climate change. And since the initial training library was changed and the, the, the algorithm will learn more about opportunities or regulations for physicals. So, we repeat the, the procedures in the, the, the procedures of keyword searching and we will end up with you know different sets of uh, backgrounds uh, talking about different topics. So uh, we have three topics, opportunities, regulation, physical. For example, if we give a solar energy to the we give a solar energy as an initial backgrounds to opportunities, we find this photovoltaic panel, the PV panel, that's a technology. Uh, in often using solar energy sectors. And similarly, we have this, you know, intuitive uh, background in regulation we found by the algorithm. And overall, I think the algorithm performed really well and it's not a black box. All the words we, you know, we, we, can, uh, we can see all the backgrounds we identified from the, from, the trans uh, from the conference calls as climate change keywords. Uh, and we do a human audit and they are making sense. And for the formal representation of the climate change exporter, it's just very simple. So basically we have, we, we chunk the, the conference call transcripts into backgrounds, basically two words combinations. And we are counting the number of, you know, uh, backgrounds which are climate change related and scale it by the total number of backgrounds in the conference call transcripts. And then we will have a ratio and that ratio measures how frequently the climate change backgrounds appear in a given transcript. And when we construct this topic-based matters, we simply replace the set of climate change backgrounds into the topic backgrounds. And after constructing our measure, and we start to some validation test. And we start doing validation test in the paper, we do a lot of face validity tests, like showing you know which backgrounds are mentioned most frequently, and showing you know uh, you know even how the firms are actually talking about climate change during conference calls, and all these things I ensure you that we are not capturing something else. And also, that's a good point, uh, a good way. I think that's an advantage of using conference call transcripts because we can always go back to the conference call transcripts and see what's really going on. And that gives, gives us a lot of confidence of our measure. And as for the time series pattern, we see the exposure to climate change increase sharply over time. And this kind of reach apply to uh, in recent years. And I think many of the, you know, the, the increase or decrease was kind of coincide with some uh, milestone events in recent years about climate change. 
Um, but one thing I want to mention is if we want to, if we plot the physical exposure of to climate change uh, in the recent years, we see a much uh, we, we see much higher volatility. So that's also consist uh, consist with our prior because you know we cannot really predict the you know when the extreme weather will kick in, and uh, you know it turns out to be very uh, volatile. We also do a single validation in a cross-sectional way. The first one is we're trying to see which industries ha uh, have the highest climate change exposure. And without much surprise, we see maybe e electricity, heavy constructions, or coal mining, and all these industries tend to have a high exposure to climate change. But one thing I want to point out is the standard deviation within the, within the industry, that means we have considerable within sector variation, given that we do have some across uh, industry variation. And that's, that's also a, a, you know, a point or a clue point towards our title, the firm level climate change exposure. So most of the variation will, uh, turns out to be uh, on the, uh, turns out to be on the firm level instead of the sector level. And also we did some sense check with the uh, country level data to, to examine whether our measure is correlated with extreme temperature and the uh, and, uh, uh, reg uh, regulations on, uh, you know, regulations on ESG disclosures. And uh, without too much, although the, of our data is on firm level, but we only have dependent variables on country level, we do find some intuitive correlation between the uh, exposure measure with, uh, with um, CPR regulation and uh, we have some weak association between our physical exposure measure with uh, extreme temperatures. So this kind of consist with our, consistent with our priors. And to ensure that to, 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 after having the time series and the cross-sectional uh, validation, we focus on, we provide further evidence on the firm level uh, virus, uh, virus decomposition, try to ensure that our measure is actually on the firm level. So from the uh, from this virus decomposition table, we can see that after including the time sector fixed effects and country fixed effects, we still have considerable variation left on firm level. It's around, uh, it's about 70% to 96%. So most of our variation uh, is, play, uh, uh, is on the firm level. And also, uh, we we and also on the on the on the bottom side of the of the of the table, we do see the about half of the firm level variation is uh, is a permanent difference across firms. It's like firm fixed effects, and the others are actually residuals or shocks. So we do have a lot of idiosyncratic or shocks in the in the climate change exposures. We also did some exposures with uh, correlates our exposures with firm level characteristics and for the sake of uh, for, the, for, for the sake of timing issues we will skip that and we also cause and the most important thing is we do have some current measure with um, uh, marrying these emissions or carbon intensities of our competing measures uh, we also want to compare our measure with these alternative measures and in terms of the virus decomposition, we do see that our measure captures more firm level variations than the carbon intensity and ISS carbon risk rating. And if we zoom in, another big advantage of our measure is that we do have much more coverage than the other two alternative measures. For example, uh, in our measure, there are Almost seventy percent of seventy percent seventy percent of observations in our sample have missing value on carbon intensity. Actually, have non-zero climate change exposures, and similarly for the ISS carbon risk ratings. So, in that sense, the the carbon the other two alternative measures actually missed a lot of firms with non-zero climate change exposures and left them in in the in in the in the in dark, so we cannot recover this uh, potential data back from the conference calls. And also, we try to correlate our measure with uh, with these two alternative alternative measures, and we do find that 
uh, for example, for the carbon intensity, uh, is of course it correlates with our major, general exposure measures pretty pretty well, but it didn't. It, it does not correlate with a physical exposure. On the other on the other hand, the ISS ISS carbon risk rating tends out to be mostly correlated with the um, uh, opportunity exposure measures, but now the regulation and the physical measures. And our, you know, our conclusion is that the overlap between the other measure and the other two alter alternative measures uh, is is partial at best. So, so I think the the key point is we do have firm, we capture more from level variation, and if we decompose our measure into different topics, and the other two measures are, are kind of focus on one or two measures only instead of the the, the you know. You know all the potential topics, and also the overlap is it's more in the sense of the coverage size. We do have a much much larger coverage, and then we try to figure out some economic relations between our measure and uh, uh, some uh, some some you know well known proxies or, or some some variables used in the uh, you know climate finance literature, and we do see our our measure. Uh, Kind of show a positive association with the media attention to climate change, but but only to the regulatory and physical shocks, not the opportunities. And also, uh, we know that the the institutional investors is one of the kind of a key proposer of the climate change or ESG investing. Uh, surprisingly, we have a we have an active association between the institutional ownership and the climate change exposure. That's Kind of um, uh, consistent with our uh, prior, but the thing is, uh, the firm level exposure to regulatory shocks and climate change opportunities, both of them uh, are having this negative association, and that is kind of surprising because we would expect institutions will differentiate between the sources of climate change exposure, will treat the you know these potential negative shocks like regulatory shocks. Differently from the climate change opportunities, but but as a as a result, it seems to be no such a, a difference. And we also have this mandatory ESG disclosure as a different variable, but we do not find our um, our measure is correlated with um, um, the, the the country level mandatory ESG, ESG disclosure regulation. I think one of the potential Explanation will be the conference calls action voluntary information exchange, but the ESG disclosure is more mandatory, so they are actually different constructs. And uh, the final uh, economic relation we check is about the firm value, and we do find some evidence that uh, the firm value would decrease if uh, uh, it's negatively associated with the exposure measures, especially with uh, regu regulatory exposure and physical exposure, uh, especially with the regulatory exposure. But that relation is only profound after 2011. So we have some evidence that in the recent years, after the awareness of climate change become more acceptable and become a consensus of the investing of the community, and this uh, climate change exposure become, you know, uh, are starting to have uh, more visible impacts on firm value. And one smart piece of the paper in the end is that we are trying to demonstrate the limited attention of market participants may kind of uh, have some uh, have some impacts on our measure. Uh, in this year, we do have the COVID nineteen, and which kind of attract a lot of attention from the from the markets. So, not surprising. Uh, on the top left picture, we we uh, we see that in the second quarter of twenty twenty, the 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 climate change exposure dropped a lot compared to the last quarter. However, if we break up in this you know this overall matter into different countries or regions, we do see. The top right picture is a Chinese, it's a, it's a China's uh, six exposure measure. And we do see the job starting from the first quarter in 2020 and rebound in the second quarter, uh, which kind of consists with, uh, with the COVID 19 situation in China. Uh, for US and Europe, we do see the, 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 
in the first call of 2020, the C6 quarter has been the more or less the same or keeping the increasing trend. And in the second quarter, the matter drops a lot. It's basically showing that the, the investors' attention to climate change has been distracted by the COVID-19. And after doing this 15, uh, 45 minutes talk, I think one key message I want to deliver is that the key challenge for investors or regulators and policymakers in climate change area is to, is to quantify the firm level exposure to the climate change. And our paper just trying to give a method that identifies firm level climate change exposure but by combining the views from the key stakeholders, that means the, the managers and also the participants in the conference calls. And by having this conference calls, we are able to, of course, capture the general exposures. And we also, we, we can also kind of separate the general exposures into different topics. We have opportunities, vehicles, and regulatory shocks associated with climate change. And as I said, our methods is pretty flexible. And if we have more different topics that are potentially interested to any investors or, or researchers, and we can easily adapt our methods to find more uh, specific topics about climate change. And, and the last point is we do have a broad coverage uh, in our data because using conference call transcript, we are able to, we have chance to kind of um, apply our method to any firms if they are holding a conference call, not even in English, we can, we can actually adapt into maybe other languages if possible, but the coverage is already broad enough, which kind of gave us a lot of opportunities to academic research and also uh, investors. And I think that's conclude my presentations. Thinking about terminology, saying something is a good emission sounds for me very weird. But, but you explained what good emissions are for you and what bad emissions are for you. Yeah, I think, so I think it's, a, it's more or less a, a comment, I think, about the, about the exposure to climate change in general, because we, uh, because in current sense, we, or in pre previous literature or in media, people normally consider climate change is more about a, a potential threats to the economy, right? But in our paper, we actually find it's much more about opportunities. So that also makes us to think about, you know, the, the previous measures on, on climate change, for example, the emission, right? So any firm, many firms will have emissions, right? So, but if we are building a nuclear power plant or we are, for example, Tesla, we also have emissions, but, but and also maybe the other car maker, which is building nine electric car, we also have emissions. And in the emission data, we cannot distinguish, you know, you know, uh, what these emissions are, are, are using towards. It can be used towards to building more, let's say, environmental friendly device, or it can be, you know, just doing some pollution or doing some, you know, old school, uh, you know, let's say, diesel cars or things. So that that's going to have a difference if we really want to quantify you know, the exposure or the potential contributions to climate change of that firm. If we only use the emission data and maybe we, we can, you know, because the emission data, emission data is just one number. And if we have the Tesla's emission and we have maybe the Volkswagen's emission, it will be hard for us to compare these numbers by, by themselves, right? Because they are building different products, but they are having perhaps the same level of emissions. And also they do have different implications on climate change. So that's kind of the, the, the reason why I mentioned this good, good emission or bad emission. It's just simply to, 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 to point out that climate change may have different impacts, but the emission data or is kind of more like uniform and it cannot capture its potential upside or downside. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, additional questions from Julian. Um, he asks, what else drives your measure other than an underlying climate risk, new, cycle, new cycles, pandemics? And should we think of this as a relative risk measure? Uh, I think that's, a, yeah, I think that's, 
that's really a good point in the sense that um, because we do see that uh, because uh, so basically our measure is driven by or is built up built upon a conference called transcripts, right? And by, by its nature, I would say it's relative because it depends on to what extent the let's say the, the analyst or the participants and also the managers are interested in some topics, right? And we do show that if we go to the picture, if we go to the picture here, we do show that, you know, I don't think in the, in the first two quarters in this year, climate change has some really big, you know, change or have some, we have some really some big shocks on climate change, but we do see a, a sharp decrease or a sharp increase in, in, the, in, in the recent two quarters on our measure. And to some extent, I agree that this is a relative measure and it will be affected by the by potential pandemics or potential other, you know, global level shocks or new, new stuff. But the thing is, if we do it in a cross-sectional level, I think that will not be a big problem. But if we compare the, you know, the numbers of our measure, you, you, you will have, you will have, you will have a problem, you know, for example, if you're looking at if you're looking at the top left, uh, the top left graph, if we do not know the background, we will see okay, what happens? The climate change scholar has dropped to has a sharp drop, right? But I don't think on firm level, these firms have a different exposure than before. Yeah, I agree with you. You know, that's a relative matter. But uh, if we consider it in a cross-sectional, you know, uh, exercise, I think it more or less will be. Kind of handled. Yeah. First of all, this is a really cool measure, right? I mean, it's and, and that you make it open source is is fantastic. Um, and I see that in this case, uh, you know, sort of a, a year fixed effect will will take care of this this sharp drop because for, you know it was for all firms the same. There was a pandemic, but I'm also, you know, just your perspective on maybe there there is a story about a CEO that you know, that will take a lot of time on a conference call. I mean, it could be also something relatively firm specific that then, you know, that climate, as you were saying, the climate risk is probably the same, but um, it just gets sort of drowned out by some other topic that that's, that's very relevant in that quarter. So I'm, you know, I'm just curious about potentially using the data. Um, I'm, I'm thinking, how would I go about well, how would I interpret this proxy then? Could I, for instance, say, I don't know, there's a, there's a general level of risk that the company has and I sort of use this relative measure you have there to, uh, to estimate, um, to, to get back to an estimate of climate risk then. But I don't know mm. if you have any thoughts about this. Yeah, so, so I think, you know, the reason why we are showing the COVID nineteen picture is that COVID nineteen is it's kind of a special setup, right? So, so normally, because as I said, most of our uh, most of the variation of our measure is played on the firm level. But uh, if we have the COVID nineteen, we do see you know on the aggreg aggregation level there is a very sharp change because that's a global event. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't consider, you know, this kind of, you know, pattern will happen frequently in the, in the, in the data or in the economy. And also I agree that, you know, there could be the case, you know, the managers are, you know, the, the, you know, the content of conference calls transcripts are driven by the interests of the managers and analysts. But this interest, we can, if we consider the conference call as a market for information, right? then the discussions during the conference call will be will likely to be the most needed information by the market, right? So if we, if we are accept, accepting this assumption or this theory, we are more or less kind of okay to say that if the firm is talking about climate change a lot during the conference call, then the firm is kind of suffering or facing climate change more than the others because First, the managers are willing to uh, are willing to talk about it, and second, the market participants are curious about it. That's more more or less driven by the demand of information, and also the supply of information, and also their exchange. That's kind of my view. 
So yeah, that's a good point. Thank you. Okay, there's another, another question from Jonathan. Um, he says there's a paper by Li et al. Who, who claimed to be the first in analyzing climate change risk in conference calls. Um, how do you differentiate from it? Uh, yeah, that's a very uh, good question. And um, so I think the Apple paper, I, uh, we, are, we are fully aware of it and we, we start that paper for sure. And I think their paper is more about climate instead of climate change. So they are talking about more about like extreme weather or natural disasters. Okay. But if we are talking about climate change, we are more, more, more likely to, to talk about maybe carbon emission renewable energy so they are kind of i would say they are very different underlying construct and it's the, the disasters or extreme weathers at best are kind of maybe the the physical climate change climate change exposure measure in our paper right that's my first point so this climate itself or physical climate is only one aspect of overall climate change and the second is the second point is we are, we have we do use very different methodology, right? So I think their paper still has a um, pre-specified training library, and they specify you know basically keywords about natural disasters, for example the I don't know the wildfire or some heavy snow, this kind of stuff, but. Um, but as I mentioned, if we want to fully capture the, the climate change exposure, we have to capture something about regulation and more importantly, something about opportunities. And using the pre-specified training library methodology, that is very difficult because we are talking about a very broad domain of you know, broad concept related, related to not only economics, but also technology and science and also politics. And we handle, so our paper, I think one of the you know, biggest contribution is to kind of the, to, to have this cable searching algorithm and to overcome these difficulties in finding or in identifying what, what are climate change, right? And then after doing that, we can, we can even you know, adapt our method to find different topics and to make our measure first capture everything, hopefully. And then we also have ability to to kind of uh, divide our general measure into different topic based measure. So overall, I think the how do we differentiate from the Lieta paper? I think first of all, it's about our you know the underlying construct. We are talking about climate change instead of only physical climate or physical uh, disasters. And second, it's about our methodology contribution because our method can not only be used in climate change, it has also be used in different topics, not even maybe COVID-19 or other topics you are interested in. The methodology will stay the same. Okay, so I, sh I should think about your identified topics also as a measure for uh, transition risk. Mm -hmm. Pardon? I beg your pardon? So I can also interpret your measure as a measure of uh, climate change and transition risk. Transitional risk, you mean um, uh, transitional transition from uh, climate um, um, polluting um, economy to a climate uh, to a emission neutral economy. Uh, because I you're not only looking at the physical risk. Yes, of course, we have. So basically, we if you if if we look at our you know climate change backgrounds, we have renewable energies, we have all kinds of things about maybe this uh, solar energy, wave energy, electric cars. We also have some regulation part. It's not about um, uh, opportunities or if you like transitional, because transitional, I would say it's like uh, economy level, right? But the things we are having something on a firm level. So yeah, for sure, some firm need to have a transitional period from a you know, polluting company or emitting company to a carbon neutral company. But some firms are born, born as you know a green company, like maybe Tesla, something like it, right? But on, on economy level, I think that's more or less what you're mentioning. But on top of on top of that, we also have regulation part. So basically, we have a lot of you know, regulatory shocks about climate change that will also introduce some exposure or risk or sentiment 
to the firm level. And uh, in that sense, it's kind of we have three parts for now. And if, if, we, if there are more kind of uh, additional aspects that uh, think are thought to be very important, we, are, we can, of course, or we can always uh, kind of uh, adapt that, you know, that different aspect and enlarge of our uh, training library or enlarge of uh, our, enlarge our you know, climate change background site. And then we can improve Thank our you. measures. Yeah. And on top side, I think it's not about risk, by the way. So we are, yeah. we are all talking about exposure now, but we do have a risk measure. So if you like it, you can always download, you know, both or all of them. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Looking at the figures, could the measure be more a measure of perception of risk or sentiment rather than risk itself now? The risk didn't change, but the attention for climate risk is lower. Uh, I think for the COVID nineteen part, that's for the COVID nineteen for the COVID nineteen picture. I think that's that's a case. So basically, if we look at the COVID nineteen pictures, I think you 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 have a point. So the attention to the climate change may be may be lower. But the, my question would be: Yes, that's the Overall, oh, that's a that's a risk measure or exposure measure based on conference calls. They are, this is a market for information, so people are exchanging information they need the, they need the most, right? But during the COVID nineteen, we we if we consider climate change as the fundamentals, we can consider the fundamentals stays relatively the same, and the market suddenly kind of uh, have no, I say lose attention on climate change and uh, focus on COVID-19. But, um, that, but that kind of sh attention shifting is not only happened on, on conference calls, but also happened on the markets itself, right? If we are observing maybe uh, the fund performance, we still see something, right? I think there is a working paper, I forgot the names. They are, they are trying to kind of see the fund flow to, basically see the fund flow to, you know, uh, to the uh, green, uh, let's say. So they are kind of say the fund flow across different types of funds. They have green funds, they have brown funds, they have normal funds. So green funds are kind of funds doing better on the ESG. So they do see, you know, this fund flow also converge uh, when we have this COVID-19. So then it's, it's not solely about investors' attention anymore. It's also about investors' real decisions. If that's the case, then I don't know. So in terms of the physical climate change or the climate change as a, as a fundamental, I don't think it will change. But if, if, if we're trying to say our measure is capturing the, how the market you know, thinks about climate change, and I think it's still doing a okay, okay job, even during the COVID-19 period, right? Because the market also, re also act as, uh, as our figure suggests here. Uh, thank you for your time, Rishan, and your really exciting presentation. Thank Great you. to have you at our seminar series. And thank you everybody for joining today. Mm -hmm.